Mental health providers in England say they have seen no significant investment in psychiatric services for children despite government plans to improve the system. Last summer, ministers said they'd invest an extra £150 million in services this financial year. Health trusts say some services are still being cut. So what impact is it having on people trying to use mental health services? Well, Amy Salmon is 18. She's been using child adolescent mental health services since she was 11. And she says she often has to wait months for treatment. Sean Duggan is the chief executive for the Centre for Mental Health, an independent charity. Good morning. Thank you both very much for joining us. Um, Sean, tell us what your perspective is on this. Money should have been coming through. A lot of people saying it simply isn't. Well, it's very disappointing, and it really should be coming through. The, the, the priority has got to be in mental health services. We've always known this for child and adolescent mental health care. Um, one in ten children suffer from a mental health problem, so that's three children in every class. Um, and we were expecting and really delighted about some extra investment into the services. The fact that it's not coming through, the providers are telling us it's not coming through, is a, is a cause for real concern. Um, why do you think it's not coming through? I mean, it, it was promised. Yeah, I, I think it's a number of reasons. I mean, we need to try and get hold of the facts here. But there are uh, reports that the money is being used by clinical commissioning groups for other reasons, uh, other pressing priorities. But as I repeat, there's no other better priority than child and adolescent mental health care. The other reason is that it's a very complicated setup. It's a very complicated uh, arrangement. And this, for the money to be used efficiently and effectively, it really has to be, the services have to be designed really well. We know a lot about the evidence as to the interventions that work. Uh, they have to be targeted properly. They have to have the right professionals in place to do that. All that takes a bit of time, but that should have really been thought of at the very beginning. So we're not in this position now, towards the end of the financial year, suggesting that the money's not getting through. So that's not an excuse. But I think there are some probably legitimate delays. But let's be open and transparent about that. And let's not have a situation where we're thinking, well, maybe the money's been used for other reasons. Uh, joining us as well now, Dr John Golding, consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Are you seeing any evidence of extra money filtering through? Um, well, it's good news that more money has been promised, and we are seeing some evidence, but I don't think all the money is getting to the frontline services as it should be. So what evidence have you seen? Well, um, I know that there have been uh, transformation plans over the last few months uh, which have bid for money, and they've been successful in, in achieving that money. So some money is reaching frontline so it's, services. It's, but it's, so it's all promises at the moment still, is it? Or do you, are, are, people, are you hearing about frontline services are actually getting the cash? I'm hearing about some frontline services getting the cash, but I'm also hearing about uh, some money not reaching the services, anecdotally. Uh, the money isn't ring fence for CAMS. I mean, it's good news that more money has been promised. I think it's about 1.24 billion over the next five years. However, um, there is anecdotal evidence that not all that money is getting to the front line because the NHS is in massive deficit at the moment. I think CCGs are using the money for other things other than CAMS. So CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, for anyone who, who doesn't know that. Um, you're talking about the importance of the money being ring-fenced. Sean was saying that there is a real suspicion that the money could just go off elsewhere. I mean, NHS England have said that money has gone through £75 million, but it's gone to clinical commissioning groups. That's How right. important is transparency? Well, it's crucially important, and unfortunately the clinical commissioning groups are under huge pressure financially, as I've mentioned, and, and the money doesn't go direct to where it's been promised to go to always. So we need to uh, track that money and make sure that it does go where it should go. Sean, do you think the money should be ring-fenced? I do think the money should be ring-fenced, because as I've said, it's, a, it's an absolute priority. And uh, if, uh, We've seen in the past that where money's been promised to a certain area, uh, and in mental health, this is not being uncommon. Uh, if you don't ring fence the money, it can go off to other more, you know, seemingly more important areas. So, it really, and it, it, we definitely need to be transparent about this because uh, the, the only way this will work is for clinical commissioning groups to work in partnership with education, with schools, uh, with the NHS providers, and they all need to have a trust in that the money's been put through, and that they can work out the financial plans and get the job. Uh, done. I mean, the government has identified this as a, a key area. Let's talk a bit more about the impact of resourcing on treatment for young people. Earlier, the parents of 15-year-old Matthew Garnet, who's been sectioned for the last six months, told BBC Breakfast that they felt like they had no rights. 
the parents and the, the child in this are seem to be devoid of their their rights um, and and I, and it is absurd and I can't you know when I tell friends who've got typical children they don't believe they don't believe that this can be happening in 2016 our most vulnerable people are being abused by this system and I can't think of a better word it, to me it feels like abuse systematic abuse Isabel Garnett, Amy, um, you've needed um, help through mental health services. Yeah. How have you felt about the sort of service you've, you've received? Um, well, once I've had access to the service, it was fantastic and I, you know, I owe my life to the, the mental health services. The problem that I face and many other people are facing is getting that access to them. Um, when I was referred to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, it took three months at that, that three-month period, I was getting worse and worse. Um, unfortunately, I was very suicidal, um, and I hadn't had one appointment with them. So three months of referrals, and I still hadn't seen them. Um, it wasn't until I had to, you know, take myself to A&E um, because, you know, I was at risk that they finally, you know, noticed me and gave me an appointment. Um, and honestly, if I hadn't gone to A&E, I don't know when I would have been seen. I don't even know if I would still still be here. It's so urgent. What was it that? took you to a and &E. it's, a, it's a story we've heard from so many people yeah. seeking mental health support that they've ended up getting it only as a result of going to a and &E. &E, Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, my mum, she was aware of the issues that was going on. She, one night she, she found me um, and I was self-harming for a long period of time, but it was just getting to the point where she was, didn't know what to do. My mum's a single mother, you know, how could she help me? You know, she can see her daughter hurting herself and suicidal, she didn't know what to do. So there was no other option at all than to go to A&E um, because obviously CAMS had been paying no attention to me um, and it was to the point that my mum didn't know when how much longer... When you say they been paying no attention to you, what, what were you being told when you were going to see, presumably your GP initially, mm -hmm. Uh, what were you told about when, what help you might expect and when you might get it? Well, as soon as I went to my GP and I got a diagnosis, I was put on medication and they said, right, you need to... How old were you then? I was 15. Um, and they said to me, you need to have, you know, ongoing therapy every week, as well as the medication from CAMS. They immediately referred me and said I'd hear from them in a week. Um, you know, every time I'd called CAMS to chase them up, I was told, I'm on a waiting list, they have to put high priority cases in front of me. Um, and that was horrible to hear because I felt, you know, why aren't I a high priority case? Why do I need to be standing in front of you with, you know, a gun to my head for you to, to, to see me as that I need help? John, that, that's another issue, but I mean, the, uh, being prescribed medication at the age of 15 sounds quite young, is that, is that a common? Well, I think it's important to use medication judiciously in young people and, and there's evidence for the use of medication, but therapeutic approaches are very important too. Mm -hmm. And I think what Amy says is sadly often true that the threshold for accessing CAMS is too high. So uh, one needs to be suicidal or self-harming sometimes before one reaches the threshold. I mean, CAMS colleagues are working extremely hard under difficult circumstances and they're very committed up and down the country, but the resources aren't adequate to meet the need. So explain in practice how that works then. It, is it a common thing for a child to present as needing help but they're told well you're not serious enough at the moment and then as time goes on they finally hit the threshold? That does unfortunately happen far too frequently uh, that the less severe problems don't meet the threshold and for very stretched services that are under resourced they have to manage their de the demand as best they can and they're in a very difficult situation as Amy is as, as a young person who needs help. Sean, are, are kids just being let down here? Well, they are, and three months was clearly, and it is too long to, to wait till you get um, a treatment plan. Uh, but we have reports across the country where it's over a year, so th there, there are very real access problems, and kids are being let down. So they, they need access to child and adolescent mental health services, but there's a whole raft of other interventions that work really well. So, for example, parenting programmes, uh, for example, group anti-bullying programmes at school, or an anger management programmes at school for children. Uh, these are really effective programmes. They're, they're, they're not expensive, and the savings that you get back on that are really quite impressive. So that's why we've got some extra money coming in now, and we really, by this stage, should start to be seeing uh, some improvements and you're quite right there is some improvements across the country but not enough. Um, so in terms of the general trajectory and the fact that it is 
uh, an issue that's being talked about much more widely in politics um, as well as obviously in other environments too. Are you confident that the money has been promised and that the, the trajectory is now the right one, the right thing is being done? I am, and I think we, we are confident. Um, and, and the money that's promised, that yeah. one and a half, uh, what, 1.25 billion over five years, yeah. what, what change will that deliver? Oh, it, it'll, it, it will, it will uh, deliver considerable improvements. There is arguments as to whether it's enough, there always is, but it, it will uh, uh, speed up the access, it will eradicate some of the problems Amy was describing earlier, so you will get better access, you will have more staff within the child and adolescent mental health services to be able to provide uh, a, a uh, assessment and a treatment plan and I think also it will provide uh, some of the things I was talking about the wider uh, treatment areas which are really effective uh, helping schools um, bringing in the educational authorities making sure the teachers uh, can screen and, and talk to professionals when they need to so we can pick up problems at a really early stage and um, John why have uh, resources been so stretched is it because it is a, a growing problem I mean, in terms of the number of children that you're seeing, the sort of issues that yeah. you're dealing with? I think there are two main factors. One is there has been disinvestment in CAMS in recent years. It's only in the last year or so that there has been more attention to CAM services and increased resources, which is an excellent start, but there's a long way to go, as we've been hearing. Um, but also, I think there is an increased prevalence of child mental health problems, anxiety, depression, self-harm, all of these are on the increase amongst teenagers in our society today, sadly. What's the, the best advice that you would give to somebody who uh, perhaps is like Amy was when she was waiting for that help and it wasn't forthcoming and, and obviously time passes, the situation gets worse. What would you say to a parent or a child who's, who's currently in, in that exact position? It is very difficult to offer advice that will simply meet the need, but um, certainly talking to people is crucial, not being isolated. A lot of young people use online services. There are services like MindEd and uh, various services that are available online, like online that can be useful, but making sure that you talk to someone, so a friend, a parent, a teacher, um, your GP, and obviously they need to put pressure on the CAM services to, to offer you the, res the resource that you need. The trouble is the CAM services are very stretched, so we are in a bit of a bind, but I'm hoping, those of us that work in CAMs, that things will improve in years ahead. And Amy, in the end, you have come through yeah. having been treated successfully, haven't yes. you? You're 18, you were talking about at 15, you were yeah. prescribed medication, but now, um, what was it that particularly worked for you in the end? Um, just finding a therapist um, who worked for CAMS that really worked for me um, and took the time to, to treat me, really. Um, once I got the access to them, once I started seeing him, you know, it got so much better just having someone who can explain things to you, you know. Young people, they have these conditions, but it's so hard to actually understand what is happening to us or happening to our minds, um, especially with mental health conditions. So just having a professional to sit and explain things to you and make you feel, you know, have an understanding of yourself, it's, it's so important. Um, and that's what really helped me the most. Thank you all very much, John, Sean and Amy. And uh, an anonymous text is saying, CAMs are underfunded. It's a naive action because if children get help early in life, they have a more level base to approach adulthood. As a magistrate, I see how long it takes to access CAMs. Do keep your thoughts coming in on that. We did uh, ask the government actually to talk to us this morning, but no one was available. In a statement, NHS England told us we still have a way to go to improve services for everyone, but work is underway to make sure care is available at home in the majority of cases or as close to home as possible when a patient needs more intensive therapy.